Hello and welcome to Sophie & Co. I'm Sophie Shebertnate. Catching terrorists is hard enough, but making them talk is even more difficult. What does an interrogator see when facing an extremist? Is there any way to understand a terrorist's mindset? Well, we ask a former US intelligence official and interrogation expert, Mark Fallon, is my guest today. Confronting terrorism isn't just about shooting the bad guys, but also getting inside their heads to prevent attacks, not deal with their consequences. How do you crack the willpower of a fanatic? What does it take to make a terrorist talk? And are there interrogation lines that shouldn't be crossed? Mark Fallon, veteran U.S. intelligence official, interrogation expert. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Now, Jordan executed two terrorists following the brutal killing of a Jordanian pilot by Islamic State militants. Is that an effective retaliation to terrorists, eye for an eye? Do they even care? Time will tell whether the uh, position of the Jordanian government is effective, but, but certainly uh, adding uh, more aggressive uh, efforts to the coalition is needed at this point. But do you feel like the terrorists care that other people on the other side execute their own, meaning the terrorists? Well, well, the, I, I, would, I would suspect that they care be, because one of the people executed was someone that they were trying to get released. Um, so, so there was meaning to them in that. Uh, and, and again, it, it, was, uh, it, it was a bit of revenge and retaliation on the part of the Jordanian government. Uh, and that's not an uncommon reaction uh, to a brutal attack like we saw there. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about how to negotiate with terrorists or do we have to negotiate with terrorists. The United States and other countries, they refuse. They say no negotiation with terrorists. Is it ever acceptable to talk to terrorists in your opinion? Does that save lives? Well, well, certainly. I, I think that you have to enter in some type of dialogue. When we say we don't uh, negotiate with terrorists, uh, that might be in a context in a hostage exchange or something in that regard. Uh, but, but certainly, we, we are developing assets within terrorist organizations. Uh, we, we are uh, listening to terrorists, and and we are we are creating counter narratives uh, to what they're saying. So, so it is important. Uh, that we hear what message they are trying to send uh, and, and really determine what the underlying message is that they're trying to communicate. No, but I'm really talking about direct communication, direct negotiations. Do you ever negotiate with terrorists? Is it effective in your well, opinion? Well, certainly some, some well, I, I, yeah, certainly entering in some type of dialogue, uh, particularly if it's a terrorist state, rather than an individual terrorist, uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there certainly may be some room uh, for entering into that, uh, into that type of dialogue uh, w with whomever your adversary is. Do you feel like there is room to negotiate with ISIS? Uh, well, I think there's room to have communications with ISIS. Uh, wh whether uh, It depends on what your definition is of negotiate uh, you know, with, with them. Uh, certainly, there was some type of dialogue at some point uh, because there were discussions about uh, uh, the pilot being released, uh, although it seemed to be a ploy and a subterfuge on, on the part of uh, uh, on the part of ISIS. Uh, but 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 certainly, uh, you you cannot uh, expect to be totally devoid of any type of communications. Uh, th there will be contact. And there will be communications generally in any type of uh, any type of conflict. Uh, you brought up hostages early on. Um, is paying ransom uh, the answer, or do you just have to face the beheadings and executions that we've seen recently? Well, you know, the, the ran ransom is a, is a key issue here, and uh, you know, the, the the challenge is that uh, one of the primary means for terrorist financing is through kidnapping ransoms. Um, so if you are going to pay ransom, uh, you are you, you do risk the, the possibility that you're actually uh, in increasing the, the risk to your country um, be because they are able to then use that funding for more recruiting, uh, for more bombs, for more ammunition, for, for whatever it is to, to fund their activities. I'm just asking you not as someone who represented the government at some point, but, you know, as a person who has a family, I'm sure, uh, do you think we should pay the ransom? if someone is held hostage, instead of just waiting till that person is being beheaded in front of the whole world on a camera? Well, uh, again, it, it, it's an incredible challenge, and it, and it takes some, some uh, very difficult leadership decisions. Um, but 
there, there, you have to determine what your policy is. If you are going to pay ransoms, uh, then you do run the risk that you are going to increase uh, their desire to kidnap your, your people. Uh, the, the challenge has come for many countries in the fact that it is not a unified position. So, so, so there are some countries that have a strict we will not pay ransom policies, and, and then there are other countries who might pay ransom. So, so it, it's not a unified position, and until uh, there is that unified position and that, that there is a, an ability to obtain funding through kidnapping ransom and, and taking hostages, then the risk is always going to be there. Now, you have personally seen many people who end up being, well, terrorists, let's say. What are the character traits as they have in common? Well, it, it's... Uh, uh, the, the, you, you can't just say there are any kind of character traits. The, the one thing that I have found uh, in, in uh, terrorist recruiting, whether it's uh, learning this from some of the uh, terrorists that I've spoken with uh, or their recruiters or their radicalizers, it, it is the fact that uh, it, it is generally about identity. What, what drives someone uh, uh, to engage in, in, in violent actions, violent extremism, uh, and regardless of the brand, wh whether it's combatants in Northern Ireland with, with the uh, IRA or loyalists, uh, if you go down to, uh, to Indonesia, Malaysia, and you look at Jamaa, Slamia, uh, to the Al Qaeda and its offshoots, it, it is generally a question of identity with an individual that, that, that will drive them to a group. And that is what the recruiters capitalize, is giving them a source of identity uh, because they're generally from a disaffected population. So um, if I am understanding you right, identity meeting, it's easier to recruit a person who has a lack of identity, who wants to belong to some sort of group. Am I correct? Yeah, they, they, they all seem to want to belong to, to something. If you look at the backgrounds and you look at that, that generally – and I'll make some generalizations, they, they are from disaffected groups, uh, populations. And, and again, if, if you look across uh, the, the spectrum, uh, and, I, and I've participated in studies on this where we went around the world and we talked to a number of violent extremists uh, and, and other combatants. Uh, and again, we, we, we went into uh, Northern Ireland, we went into France, uh, we went into some of the Scandinavian countries. Which we went down to Southeast Asia. And, and what you find when you talk to these individuals, uh, there, there are triggers uh, that, that might set them off. But, but it is generally when you talk to them, that sense of identity that drives them to a group and, and gets them to, to engage in the activities that that group wants them to do. And you're saying there is no difference, or you saw no difference, between the Irish terrorists that you have worked with, uh, I mean, not worked with, but spoken to, and the Islamic terrorists? Yeah, I'm, well, I, we're all individuals, so, so it, it, it's hard. P people always want to try to see that there's some specific characteristic that would lead someone directly into terrorism or to violent extremism. Uh, and, 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 you know, some people may be highly educated, some might be uneducated. Uh, but, but, but generally, what I would say across the board is, uh, it is that sense of identity uh, that drives them. And I found that talking to folks uh, in Northern Ireland who, who uh, were part of that conflict uh, 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 many decades ago, uh, to, to folks in the jails in, in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, who, are, who are more recent inductees in, into, uh, into the jail system there. It, it is that identity uh, that, that has driven them to do what they were doing. Now, these terrorists, uh, for you, they were, they were an enemy with information to extract. But did you at any point see them as human? Oh, absolutely. We're, we're, all, we're all human beings. And, and, and as, as despicable as their actions might be, uh, as a professional uh, criminal investigator uh, who is doing an interrogation, your goal is to extract information. It's to elicit accurate and reliable information that is useful as either intelligence or as evidence. Um, so so uh, what, what you have to realize, as heinous as those acts might be, they aren't human beings, and, and the, the best way to approach them is through understanding that and then capitalizing on, 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 on their, their nature 
once you understand where they're coming from. All right, hold your thought there. We're going to take a short break right now. When we come back, we'll continue talking to former U.S. intelligence officer Mark Fallon about the interrogation methods used to deal with terrorists and how much information can be gathered through torture, for instance. Stay with us. is the only industry specifically mentioned in the Constitution? That's because a free and open press is critical to our democracy. In fact, the single biggest threat facing our nation today is the corporate takeover of our government and our press. We've been hijacked by a handful of powerful transnational corporations that will profit by destroying what our founding fathers once built up. I'm Tom Hartman, and on this show, we reveal the big picture of what's actually going on in the world. We go beyond identifying the problem. We try to fix it. Rational debate and a real discussion of the critical issues facing America. Stand by on camera. Go. Ready to join the movement? Then welcome to the big picture. that can't be ignored. Stories others refuse to notice. Faces changing the world right now. A full picture of today's news. Live, on demand, from around the globe. Rockley.tv First-rate news and eye-gripping pictures. On our reporter's Twitter and Instagram. To be in the know, follow us online. Dramas that can't be ignored. Stories others refuse to notice. Faces changing the world right now. A full picture of today's news. Live, on demand, from around the globe. Rockley.tv We're back with Mark Fallon, veteran U.S. intelligence officer, talking about his experience in dealing with terrorists. So, Mr. Fallon, did you see any of the terrorists you faced repent or feel sorry for what they've done? Oh, absolutely. Uh, ma many of them felt that they were tricked into getting into the violent extremism, uh, and, and, and a good many of them uh, uh, feel quite a bit of remorse. Uh, some have even uh, are now trying to... Uh, uh, engage in strategies uh, that are called disengagement strategies. They're actually trying to convince people uh, not to go into violent extremist groups. Now, when you're facing a terrorist sitting next to you or in front of you, um, defeated in your power, cracked under interrogation, you as a military man, do you feel satisfaction defeating your enemy or do you feel sorry for them? Well, yeah, you have a job to do, and 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 certainly, uh, I would feel a great sense of satisfaction if, if, if whenever there is uh, uh, information elicited that could help uh, as actionable intelligence uh, that can help save lives, or that might be used to help uh, convict someone who's committed heinous crimes. So, so certainly, a great deal of uh, of satisfaction. But, but uh, you, you mentioned something that that is kind of common about the somebody cracking. 
Uh, and, and if you watch television shows and the movies, there's always that, that person that cracks. And, and in reality, uh, information seeps out. Uh, and, and it's a long, deliberate process where you're continuing to elicit information and then trying to validate it and corroborate it uh, and, and then go back and, 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 and try to elicit more information. So it, it's not that uh, it's not the Hollywood version, usually, where there's just a cracking. It, it, it's a seepage and a flow of information uh, that may be useful. So while that information is being seeped out, uh, you're obviously making an effort to understand the person who is sitting in front of you. So does that in any way hinder your ability to do your job? Because you're kind of starting to understand that person and relate to that person. No, I actually, uh, it's critical to doing your job. Uh, the, the, the best interrogators know their subject and know their subject matter. Uh, so they will study the individual uh, before they go in. Uh, I'm often referred to as an interrogator, and, and I don't refer to myself as an interrogator. I was an investigator, and interrogation was a part of what I did as an investigator. Uh, but, but, but the key was understanding the facts and circumstances I was looking at so that when I did interrogate someone, I would understand when the information was accurate and when it was not accurate. And if I did a lot of background uh, information about the individual, uh, I would have a much better chance of understanding when they were being deceptive or not. Uh, so so that, that knowledge, I think, is critical for someone to do an effective interrogation. Now, obviously, everyone's wondering why so many people these days um, go and uh, follow jihad and they end up being a uh, member of ISIS and you have all these different people from America and France, Great Britain, even Russian Muslims who know very little about their religion and they still um, end up going there and fighting with ISIS. So when you meet these people and you've met a lot of them, um, do they end up terrorists because of an idea or they mostly are joined up for the thrill? Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question, and, and that's one that I, that I think uh, most people have wrong. Uh, th this is not a religious war. Uh, th 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 this is a war over land. Uh, this is a war over uh, ideology, uh, but it's not a war about theology. Uh, ISIS knows very little about religion. Um, I, 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 I talked to one former... IRA member one time, and I asked him uh, how he got through being on the blanket. Uh, was it due to his faith being a Catholic? And he said, what would make you think that? America has us wrong. I'm an atheist. Th this isn't about religion. This, this is about being loyal uh, uh, to, to the United Kingdom uh, or, or, or being national uh, uh, you know, to, to, to the Re Republic of Ireland. So, uh, so the media and a lot of pundits uh, call this a, a religious war, and I just don't buy into that. That was the narrative that bin Laden created. That is used to recruit people, uh, but, but, but that is not what I have found to be the driving factor uh, in folks who have uh, killed people and bombed people. And then there are those who want out. Uh, and recently, Uyghur fighters were executed by ISIS for deserting. Does that mean that there is no way back for someone who is disillusioned with their choice? Well, that, 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 that is actually, uh, frankly, played to the advantage of some of the countries um, when folks w went across to fight. Uh, and and th this is something that occurred uh, with al-Shabaab. Uh, th there, there, there was a great concern uh, that people would travel from the United States, go over there, uh, be trained how to, how to kill, uh, and then come back. Uh, fortunately... Uh, those people were over there, and some of them were killed, uh, and some of them committed suicide, and, and their passports were taken. They were not able to get back. Um, so, uh, so, so the fact that ISIS is actually doing that uh, might actually be to the advantage of the countries that these uh, citizens are, are leaving from uh, because they actually don't have a way to get back uh, to their home countries. Let's talk a bit about torture. Now, you were a chief investigator on a DOD task force. You've developed interrogation policies, training programs, oversaw thousands of terror suspects' interrogations. Under your guidance, was any reliable information obtained through torture? And did it save lives? Yeah, no, no I, I, I am unaware of any accurate reliable information that was a direct derivative product uh, of torture. All right, so the bigger question then is why was it used for so long if it's inefficient? 
Well, well the, you know, if you look at how it was created, uh, the, the EIT program was created within the, the Central Intelligence Agency, but it was not created by interrogation professionals. Uh, it was the, 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 the core competency of the Central Intelligence Agency is not interrogations. They're a, a, a human intelligence organization primarily. Once they went down this road and they created programs uh, that were ill-advised, were not based on any evidence-based research, uh, it was uh, what, what a lot of my friends call voodoo science, uh, they, they were kind of locked into that narrative, and, and, and they've actually, they, they misled the White House, uh, they misled the Congress, uh, they misled the media, and they misled the American public for years, uh, and that's all documented in, the, uh, in what's called now the torture report, um, and obviously when you talk about torture, Guantanamo always comes up and the conditions in that prison, the torture that went on there, I mean, it's all public knowledge at this point and also a selling point for jihadist recruiters. Why did the U.S. military and the government allow itself to behave like that if the end result is really only more terrorism? Yeah, absolutely. They, they were misguided policies uh, that were created at the time. Uh, and, and there's an incredible price that we will pay for decades to come. Uh, uh, Guantanamo Bay uh, and Abu Ghraib uh, were major recruiting uh, uh, assets for terrorist groups. Uh, they were for years. The, the CIA's RDI program, the EITs, gravitated from the CIA to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and, and then the general in charge of Guantanamo Bay was sent into Iraq. Uh, and and the, the, it was credited with Gitmoizing Iraq and, and helped contribute to what happened at Abu Ghraib. Um, so, so clearly, from my perspective, uh, my professional opinion is uh, that that RDI program uh, was a significant threat to our national security uh, because it actually enabled Al Qaeda and other groups uh, to recruit terrorists to fight against us uh, and, and, and to raise funding. Uh, to use against us. So it was clearly, clearly a terrible mistake and, and it's a price we're going to continue to pay. Um, but also 9-11 was something uh, that started this whole war on terror and a major section of the Congressional Intelligence on 9-11 report has been classified for the past 13 years. What is in there that has to stay hidden to public? Yeah, th th that I, I don't know. Uh, I was not privy to those classified portions. Uh, I do know that some members of the 9-11 Commission uh, are now advocating that, that some of that uh, uh, might want to be released at this point. Uh, the, 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 the problem, uh, I know when I was with the government, the, the real challenge was ensuring that, that, that really classified information was redacted from, for, from different studies. Uh, the, the, you, you, you should not be uh, redacting political information or embarrassing information. Uh, the, the real key is, w would the disclosure of that information have an adverse impact on your national security? Uh, and that's some of the, the, the problems that we saw with the CIA RDI program. Uh, they classify things and they redact the information and they try to keep information from the public, not not for national security purposes, uh, but but possibly for political purposes, for career purposes, and for embarrassment purposes. And if you look at what has been disclosed in in the the torture report, uh, you you can see uh, uh, some very very revealing information uh, that has been disclosed after quite a bit of uh, 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 challenges between. Uh, the United States Senate and the executive branch over disclosing that information. Um, before the start of war on terror, Al Qaeda was a relatively small organization and now it has opened up shop across the Muslim world and its offshoots are now a threat to uh, on their own actually. That's not a very good track record. Uh, what went wrong with the war on terror in your personal opinion? Yeah, and of course, for me, uh, the, the, the first salvos in, in this war uh, were really the attack on the USS Cole in Aden, Yemen, uh, in, in October of 2000. Uh, yeah, quite a bit went wrong. At, at the time, uh, and, and I was investigating al-Qaeda at that time, uh, the, the, the numbers of al-Qaeda were estimated to be probably between two and 400 uh, people at the time of the Cole attack and at the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and, and unfortunately, 
um, we, we, we did not have very good strategies uh, to, to counter them. And we countered them with tactics rather than strategies. And, and now Al Qaeda ranks in the thousands and it's franchise and it's become, it's become a brand. Uh, I think we could have done things differently and I think we should have done things differently. Uh, had we treated uh, detainees w with greater dignity and respect, it would have enabled us to elicit more accurate and reliable information and intelligence. Uh, had we tried them before a just process um, uh, whether it be military commissions or, or uh, in the U.S. court system. Uh, but, but, it, but if we led uh, uh, by example and actually had proceedings uh, that were transparent uh, and, and that uh, uh, utilized the rule of law, I think things uh, might have been different and, and could have been different. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, particularly the Iraq War uh, um, uh, enabled uh, al-Qaeda uh, to say that uh, they were right uh, because they were saying, bin Laden was saying we would invade Iraq, bin Laden was saying this was about oil. Uh, and, and, and so uh, that, that invasion actually helped uh, bin Laden uh, uh, quite a bit uh, in, in, terrorist, in terrorist recruitment. Thank you very much for this interesting insight. We were talking to Mark Fallon, former U.S. intelligence officer, interrogation expert, talking about his experience in dealing with terror. That's it for this edition of Sophie and Co. I will see you next time.